to teach an interdisciplinary course with somebody from a completely different discipline. See, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my dad was already on the editorial board of the Boy Poetry <laughs> Journal, a quarterly uh, magazine of contemporary poetry, and uh, Marion did all the business and most of the screening of the magazine for over 50 years. Until her final illness, she wrote reviews of contemporary poetic poetry, which were widely admired. In 1984, David and Mary retired to the Lemoyne home, where they had lived part-time since 1970, bringing the Beloit Poetry Journal with them. After Dave's death in the fall of that year, Mary learned to drive a car for the first time <laughs> and began a new career, serving on the Maine's Arts Commission as a member from 1984 to 88, and then as the chair of its literature panel, then as a commissioner and chair of the Community Arts Committee. 1993 to 1999. She edited the first Hancock County Cultural Directory for the Arts Commission in 1997. She was a champion of state and federal support for community arts, which are now recognized as an important feature of what has become known as Maine's creative community. Marion died uh, in 2009 at age 86, working hard until the end. <laughs> so, is uh, making a videotape of this for the uh, town hall. And uh, Stu Marcoum, as you know, always makes DVDs available to, for people who would like them. And uh, I just wanted you to know that. OK, now let me introduce Chris Hansel, director of Curtains Without Borders. Chris is passionate about finding painted curtains around New England. She somehow found, found us several years ago, came, saw me at a curtain, that, uh, and it was in pretty good shape. It needed work, but with her help, she could do the work on it. And so um, we, we couldn't do it immediately at that time, but we started uh, figuring out how to manage it. And fortunately, we have been able, and this very week, the refurbishing was done, and she will explain more about what that process is. Chris comes from a foreign service family and has lived in London, Addis Ababa, uh, Mogadishu, and Accra, Ghana, as well as Chicago and Berkeley. Um, with academic degrees in Slavic languages and literature, she turned her focus to the arts and humanities. And when she settled in Vermont, she served on numerous state and local commissions that supported uh, those endeavors. Uh, her discovery of the tradition of painted curtains led to setting up a means for restoring them and for her publishing two books about it and writing numerous articles about it. In 1999, she received the Vermont, Council, uh, the Vermont Arts Council Governor's Award for Excellence. That was years ago. She's still doing it. <laughs> so please welcome Chris Hatzel. Boy, the month's past does come out to haunt one, doesn't it? Um, I, I really shouldn't. I, am, I would not take all credit for all, all of the discovery and all the work. I am the director, which means that I tell people where to go and when to be there. And I have all the materials in my garage, and I bring stuff, and I organize people. I have a conservation team of conservators. We're trained conservators, and they are in charge of the work. So here is a woman named MJ Davis, Mary Jo Davis. Uh, she lives in Newark, which is north of St. Johnsbury. I mean, it's way up by Lake Willoughby, if anybody has any idea where Lake Willoughby is. And, uh, She's become the main curtains conservator over the last 23 years. And together we have worked on probably about 300 curtains. Um, it all started when I was uh, the director of the Vermont Museum and Gallery of Arts. This is my main, main head of the Museum Association some years ago. And it folded. And actually Vermont also folded. It was a, it was a, 
thing of the 80s and the 90s when everybody was feeling very cooperative and now they just don't cooperate in the same way. But I was director and MJ was my roving collections manager. So her job was to go on site to historical sites, museums, galleries of all sorts, anybody who had a collection of anything, and try to figure out what they needed to um, help preserve their collection. So it might be workshops on how to store costumes. It might be a workshop on how to make labels, how to uh, make inventory, how to uh, develop a children's education program you know, based on your stuff. It was anything and everything to do with owning a collection. And the word collection was as broad as you wanted to make it. So some historical societies in Vermont are upstairs in town halls where the upstairs is not accessible. And because they were not accessible, they could no longer be used for town purposes. But the town would say to the historical society, you can have this space for your collection, you can do programs because you're not an official town organization, etc. And so upstairs is where the stages are in all these little white buildings all over New England. And so some of the historical societies had a curtain. And they would be torn and dirty. There might be four or five of them. There might be, uh, who knows, they might be held up with bailing twine and might be stored under the stage. But whatever they were, they were big and they were dirty, and they had, and the historical society had no idea what to do, and nor did we. So basically, I set out as anybody who's a director of a small nonprofit. Basically, what you do is you raise money. So I set out to write grants to try to learn about these curtains and then to figure out what to do, how to actually come in and conserve them. And fortunately, uh, the National Endowment for the Arts just got it. They, they, there were two people working at the NEA at that point. I went to Washington to meet them. You know, it's one of the things you do also is you go and you meet people. You don't just talk to them on the phone or write them letters. And these two guys at the NEA adopted us. And we got NEA grants for the next 20 years. We are a tiny organization. We work out of my spare bedroom, but they never knew that. They thought we were a proper organization um, because that's where we talked. But at any rate, um, we had NEA money. Um, we had Save America's Treasures money. We had, I got $50,000 from the state legislature. So I raised a, a lot of money, and we decided to set out and find how many there were and then try to learn how to conserve them. And I pulled together a team of conservators, textile conservators, painting conservators, paper, and objects. Those are the four main disciplines in conservation. And we had long powwows about what to do, how to figure out what, what they were made of, how to figure out how to mend them, how to handle them, how to make a roller if the roller was broken. All these things it took time and a lot of experimenting. But eventually, we found 192 curtains in Vermont, and we have restored 190 of them. There are two more in September, and that's it. Then we will have done every single curtain in Vermont. And I have been in every single building. I have been in the attics, and I have looked under the stages. I, there are no more. There are 192. So as we moved along, people from New Hampshire and Maine started writing or calling and saying, when can you come help us? And I had no money to go to New Hampshire or to Maine, but I got the NEA to give me more money to do a survey, first in New Hampshire, then in Maine, then in upstate New York, then in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And this Maine survey meant that I worked with Maine Preservation and the main state historical society and the main state branch and to just try to identify where the curtains were and then i would get in the car all the way from burlington and make a four or five day loop and go see 20 curtains 30 curtains at a time and on one of those swings um, i was in salisbury cove and 
my contact person over there said, oh, there's a curtain in the Grange in the morning, right across from us, because they look this way, and their picture is of you guys, <laughs> and their picture is of them. But she knew that this curtain was here, so she um, told me that it was here. So on one of my big swings, I came by and knocked on the door, probably went across the street. I found somebody that had a key, and just came in and measured it, took a picture, and that was all I did at that point. So years later, um, when I was back spending a couple of weeks in Stonington, I came back up with my husband and walked in the door and persuaded, I don't think it was Carol, it was somebody else, I don't think it was you at that point. Somebody was here and I said, why don't, why don't we plan someday to come and clean and mend and reset your curtain? Because it was not bad, but there were certain things that need doing if you want to keep it for another 50 years. And here we are. So finally we got back and um, worked on it this week and basically cleaned it up. It was nice and dirty. It had not been cleaned for a long time. Um, there was a nice rip, I forget where it was, one part or the other, and it had been carefully mended with uh, medical tape. <laughs> so that's all right, it melted it together. Even duct tape is okay. It means holding it together so that the rip doesn't get bigger. Because one of the things that we quickly found is that all curtains are made of muslin. And one of the things about muslin is if you start to rip it, you can rip it in straight lines forever. And it rips easily. And so once you start a tear on the side, you can get a rip five feet long, eight feet long in no time. And that's what you don't want to have happen. So by mending the tear, even with the medical tape, it kept it from getting worse over the years. So we took off the tape and we put a patch on the back. And one, I'll, I'll tell you more about some of the materials we use, but what I'm going to do is, um, well, first of all, this curtain is, it has a little bit of a complicated, complicated backstory. It was the basics, the, the basic structure of it, and this gold and brown edging were made in Boston, or in Somerville, by a company named O.L. Story. They were very fancy, they were very high end. This was actually a very plain curtain, but it was ordered from them and it came up, and we don't know if it had a picture in the middle, but we are inclined to think, well, we just don't know, because it's completely gone, completely overpainted. So in the 50s, right? 40s. When did Maxwell Lee? Uh, uh, Maxwell Lee only came in the 40s. The 40s. Long comes, and the, the, but the basic stuff is from the 1920s. So I don't think it stayed blank for 20 years. It just you wouldn't have had a curtain up here with nothing on it for 20 years. But in the 1940s, along comes Maxwell Lillian, and he's from Bar Harbor. He's a local artist. He painted the curtain in Salisbury Cove, the one in Eastbrook, and this one. And he then proceeded to paint this scene in acrylic paint, not the water-based paint that was around the edges. So if you were within three or four inches of it, you'll see it's crackled all over because it's acrylic. And when the acrylic paint rolls, it ends up crackling. The water-based paints don't crackle, which is partly why that's what they use. That's what the scenic artists preferred. But he used acrylics for all three curtains that are around. And so this is the view looking at Salisbury Cove. As I say, there's one looking this way. And then Eastbrook has a winter scene. And uh, none of them, well, this, is, this one is not signed. Um, one of them is, so I forget which one. No, um, both, um, both, Eastbrook, both Eastbrook and, and Salisbury, Salisbury Cove are signed. Yeah. And this one is not, but it is very clearly his work. It's, it's, a, it's, it's virtually a bad call in terms of paint and the, and the brushwork and so forth. So what I'm going to do... Chris, could I interrupt one thing when you said you weren't sure if O.L. Story ever had a picture? Right. The Grange Minutes did say that, uh, that the company said to them, 
you need to pick a couple of your members to work with us and pick a scene that is something in Le Moyne that you would like on the curtain. So right. we don't know if it was this one or a different one, but we're just, we don't well, know. It's not this. <coughs> anyway, this is this is not a well story. In any no, shape no. It is. So the question is whether there was some water-based paint, uh, water-based picture underneath it, or what? It's very hard to tell. There's also a little squirreliness about the sides. It's a little too big for your stage. You see how that brown layer at the top. That is also down below that golden layer down there, but there's but you don't see it. On both sides, there's brown and gold. There's another this much on both sides that you don't see. Normally, that's not the way things are done. Normally, they are the curtain would have been cut, the fabric would have been cut to fit this opening, but just a little bit on the edges. So there's. This, is, this curtain is too big for this stage. On the other hand, the, they could have altered the, the arch. It's hard to know. Or this could even have come from somewhere else. It could have been, well, except you have a building that burned. So who knows? There's something slightly weird about your curtain. <laughs> Never mind. It's, it's charming, and now it's clean. It has new ropes. It has new pulleys. and. It has new boards on the top, and it's all straightened out. And with a bit of luck and some care, it'll be good for another generation or two. So what I'm going to do is put the screen up here and take you for a ride through a lot of Grange curtains in Maine. That's what I'm going to focus on. I could focus on Vermont or New Hampshire or whatever, but since you're here, um, I'll show you a lot of pictures, uh, and it'll help you see how your curtain fits in with the whole genre of painted scenery. Okay, I'll help you with it. All right. Okay. Let's see. Okay, all we gotta do is not trip. One, two, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. This is a much more typical Grange Hall curtain than yours. Almost all Grange Hall 
almost all grain beasts paid for their curtains, whether they had one or more, by selling ads. And the ads are local businesses, sometimes they are um, statewide uh, insurance companies that all ranges use, that kind of thing. This one up in Benton, the nice thing about it is that this is all painted. That's all painted drapery. It all rolls up. And it's, it's quite elegant in its own way, and they have this very nice um, fancy ceiling. They discovered the colors on it, so they restored the colors. And this is another one by the same company up there in the Bangor Transportation Museum. It came from Grange in Bangor, but sometime, or sometime long ago, it ended up in storage up there. But you can still see, there's, I'm going to figure out my person here. Okay, this bit of gold is the same as, uh -huh. all right, it's the same as that gold that you're seeing on here. It's their trademark. They use gold paint, gold curtains, and a blue background for the for the ads, just like that one. And then this is a company in Massachusetts called the Wood Brothers. So every time I buy a roll of curtain and I get to sort of a bluish color, I know who did it. Now this one over in Bryant Pond is a backdrop as opposed to a grand drape. Now a grand drape. Your curtain is a grand drape, but it has no drapery. But the reason it's a grand drape is because it's right at the front, right behind the arch. Whatever curtain is right behind the arch, it's called a grand drape, whether it's drapery or not. Anything else is a backdrop. It might be partway back, it might be all the way back, but this here is a typical street scene backdrop, along with a nice dirt line right there. They don't, they've lost their grand drapes, so we don't know who painted this. But here is a typical grand drape in Cambridge. And this is all, again, painted. This is not cloth. I mean, it's not separate cloth, it's painted. And the idea is the curtains are being pulled back so you can see the scene in the middle. And it's a very European scene. It's uh, romantic, it's long ago and far away. And that's what a lot of the curtains did for Grand Drapes, because people come in and sit down. It's like going to the movies, and a Walt Disney movie, and seeing that little palace with Tinkerbell right around it. I mean, long ago and far away, and you're supposed to feel, feel sort of happy. Now this one, in Chesterville, I know. This one is painted by a man from Monmouth, not signed, but we know it is. But look how elegant, oh my gosh. But the whole thing has turned brown. It was purple. Purple, after 100 years, becomes brown. And purple was a color that a lot of curtains, or not a lot, but many curtains incorporated purple because it was vaudeville time, because it was, it was variety show. It was happy, um, slightly gaudy. But over time, it turns brown. And I do not know where that clip is. But the sad thing is, I got a call last week. They are selling the range. They don't have $20,000 to fix the roof. So they're abandoning the two and a half story large range. And fortunately, they are moving, they are merging with another range, not very far away. So. On my way back from Maine next week, I'm going to stop. I'm going to help them take down the curtain, roll it up, and take it to the other branch. The other branch doesn't have a curtain. So this one will go, it says Chesterville, but they're merging the two branches. So we think that we'll have a home for this one. But it's touch and go. When the range is closed, it's, it's a hard thing to save the curtains. Now this one, I'll just point back. This one here, you see this circle, this very elegant framework uh, with the picture inside. There it is again, the same kind of round uh, picture frame. This one again is very pink, very green, but 100 years of broad daylight, you know, without ever 
wrote out of her uh, keeping it rolled up, had faded it very badly. But I love the fact they put cows in the middle of their grand dream. <laughs> you know, not a castle, not their own scenery, but some cows. And this one at North Jail. Now you can see, you see now how we how I identify that it's the same painter with the with all this kind of detail. And then here it is again. None of these curtains are signed, but we know who painted them just because of the style, because of the use of that decorative border. This one I love. Here is the guy in the middle of the desert. He's lost. He's on this black horse, and he's asking the guy on the camel the way. It's a very romantic <laughs> image, a lost traveler. And, and so here it is, and it's almost like it's on a great plate. And all that drapery, it's just beautiful. But the other thing about North Che is they have a complete set of curtains. Now, a complete set of curtains <laughs> is five curtains. There's the grand drape, there's a street scene, there's a fancy interior, there's a kitchen interior, and then there's a country scene at the way back. That set of five is the standard set, if you're going to have a set of curtains. It also includes these side pieces, they're called ears. They hide the junk on the stage, but they also help make the scene bigger. So this here, there's an ear that matches the curtain, and here's an ear. And then these two are just used for filler, and they match the country scene. So North J, here's their street scene. I mean, if that isn't a dirt line, I have not seen a dirt line. <laughs> Ooh, that's because it's been rolled up, kept rolled up for years on end. All the dirt settles on top. And I just am dying to get my vacuum cleaner on that, because it'll come right off. But it needs to be carefully done. But here's your street scene. It's certainly not North J. It's, um, <laughs> you know, it's generic. It's more urban. It's more fanciful than anything anybody in North J would ever see normally. It even has trolley tracks. You know there's no trolleys. But the middle part of the street scene is always left empty because that's where your guy with your top hat your tap dancer, your magician, all those sort of solo performers would perform right in front of the street scene. And it becomes part of the, the, the way that you provide a space for, for a performer. Oh yes, there's that country scene again, of that rustic interior. The most popular play for, from about 1900 to 19 through the First World War, was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Oh my gosh, everybody did Uncle Tom's Cabin all the time. Every high school, every grade school, everybody did it. That and Huckleberry Finn. So you had to have a rustic interior if you're going to do Uncle Tom's Cabin. You can't put him in a fancy Victorian parlor. So that's why there's such a common use of, of this, um, this very simple interior. And by the way, here's the grand drape rolled up with just that front top bit left to hide all the other rolls. Now back to uh, advertising curtains in Andover Town Hall. Again, one of these beautiful ceilings. So here are the ads. The, the drapery, they've actually lost their arch. They now have just a platform. But the drapery, you see, is just a token. There ain't much of it. And it's just sort of sitting there on the edges is a kind of decorative thing. But in the middle you've got Greek goddesses, all kinds of stuff going on. Now East Basselboro, this is by a little story. And this this is a very faded version of his most popular scene, which is Shion Castle, sitting there in Lake Putsan. And Shion uh, Castle is where Byron wrote the poem, The Prisoner of Shion. And every young lady had a copy of that, a little copy of it, the little pink ribbon. Um, it was a very popular young lady's uh, poem. So again, it's something everybody knew. Now this here, 
It's the same coloration as what you've got. And actually at the top, you can see a little bit of uh, design that's the same stenciling. But here you've got the drapery added. And again, it all pulls up. So that is the grand drape of East Vassalboro. It's, it's, it's in mm, not very good condition because it's been so faded over time. But there is their street scene, which they kept rolled up. The grand drape they kept down, and it faded year after year after year after year. But the street scene, they kept rolled up. So look how bright and happy it is. And uh, again, it's a generic street scene. It's not East West Vassalboro. And there's the grand drape rolled up to provide the top piece. And here's the empty area in front where your performance performers would be. They had all five curtains of the set, but they are missing their ears, their side pieces. Now this is the one up there in Eastbrook that is signed by uh, Maxwell Leon. Uh, it is the same um, acrylic paint as yours. At least it's very white. But it's a winter scene, and the drapes have faded again because they've got a window that has light that's coming straight across. So this one, you know, has to be worried about because apparently the range is not secure, and if they actually close the building and go away, what will happen to the curtain? I don't know. And here's the one in Salisbury Cove looking <laughs> over this way. So again, token drapery, and Maxwell Leland was not very good at painting drapes. Uh, what he liked was this sort of late uh, watery scene. And so that's the one directly across the cove. And this one in North New Portland. Now, North New Portland is nowhere near the ocean. It's, it's inland. It's, uh, I don't know what it's near, but it's not near, nowhere near the coast. But they obviously, they love the idea they were New Portland, which is Portland. So they wanted the seascape. And again, there's no drapery on this, but it is the grand drape because it's right behind the arch. And it's done by a local painter who painted for a theater group, the only curtain he ever did. So it's a great big, and this thing's 20 feet wide and 20 feet high. Wow. It's, it's twice the size of your curtain. Wow. This little range, <laughs> um, Guilford Valley Grange, the, the man who painted this was a Polish refugee. And so we have winter, summer, and fall. We don't seem to have spring. Spring just sort of disappeared. But it's very uh, 1920s. You see, he's got straight lines. He's really a painter who is not a scenic artist. Scenic artists are always interested in depth and in perspective that you know, where you look out into a scene. And here you get this chopped up um, three panels. They're, they're very nice, but they're not, they don't have the kind of depth that a true scenic artist would give it. Uh, this one, <laughs> this is Searsport Town Hall. It's the town hall that the Greens used to meet in the town hall. So here you have all the ads that paid for the curtain. And you've got, uh, Great seascape. All this blue, no, I'm sorry, this blue here and here, they are actually brand new drapes that pull across. So they don't have to unroll and roll up the curtain every single time they want to do anything. This is a big stage. But all this is painted, and then the middle part, these new drapes come in in front of the curtain. It's, um, it's a very interesting, we have no idea who painted it. It's not signed, it's not like anything else, we don't know. Down in Harrison, this one is by one of the three women uh, scenic artists that we know about, Helen Tooker. And Helen Tooker and her sister used to go around and offer their services, they would sell one sister would sell the ads, and then Helen would do the painting. And uh, the problem is, 
that the sister would sell twice as many ads as there was room for. So when the curtain was actually revealed and half the ads were nowhere to be found, they tended to get run out of town. Because they'd taken the money, and they, they'd taken the money, they did paint the curtain, but the advertisers were not on the curtain. So they were known to be uh, a little bit slick. Now this one in Troy, and again, this is a cranes that is closed since I was last there, which is very sad. This is actually an old advertising curtain that was turned upside down and then painted on the back. So the other side of it has still got the advertising curtain, but the front of it they painted with this kind of fairy tale-like picture, the castle. It looks very much like a kind of a illustration for, for a children's book. It's very, very pretty. But they have closed the Grange, and the Grangers have all disappeared, and the, um, the town clerk says she has no idea what's happened to the curtain. I just hope that it didn't go to the dump. I hope it's somewhere. Now, over in Jefferson, um, Jefferson is, oh, from here, where is Jefferson? It's, it's not near here. It's, some, it's somewhere north of the Route 1. It's a, kind of a, an Augusta suburb north of Route 1. Okay, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> I, get, I do get confused. There are so many main towns. But this is a very, very nicely kept range. This is a range where lots of stuff goes on. They still have suppers. They have, if not weekly, they have monthly suppers downstairs. They serve you know, 100 people at a time. They have a new modern kitchen. They put on, um, not plays so much, but little, uh, they put on little concerts and things like that. And this, they have a full set of the five curves. And this particular company is a company from Boston, L.L. Graham, and the, uh, the awkward, <laughs> the awkward drapes is actually one of the signatures of, of this company. They did, everything else is very well done, but the drapery is just bizarre. <laughs> you just don't tie drapes that way. But here we have Venice. Venice is very popular on curtains because again, the romance. Everybody knew about Venice, even people off the farm knew about Venice and how you know, it was watery and it had these beautiful uh, buildings in it. So there's the Grand Tree. There's the street scene. <laughs> See, it looks very European compared to some of those other streets. And you get the trolley tracks, you got a funny covered, sort of covered wagon. It's almost like a gypsy wagon going down the street. And one of these very narrow buildings, here's the other street going down there, the church. It's full of depth and, pers and pers uh, perspective, but it's very un-American. It's really a, a European street scene. And here is their formal interior. This is typical of a formal interior. You have a doorway, you know, painted shut. You have side pieces that, that fill out the sides. And then you have either wallpaper or fancy stenciling. So all you have to do is put a little ornate table, maybe a little settee, and you have your Victorian parlor. You have whatever scenes might go on in a, in a Victorian, you know, Jane Eyre type situation. And then here is their rustic interior, looking very rustic. I mean, <laughs> Complete with you know uh, cracks in the wall. So here's a piece of you know wall that seems to have come apart. It hasn't. I mean, this is all in good shape. But these ears on the other side match the formal interior. All you have to do is turn them around, and you get the rustic interior. And then there's the backdrop of the country scene. And the country scene is all-purpose country. It's nowhere in particular. Usually there's a stream, maybe a little road, some nice trees, and here again, the ears that match. So the ears provide a place for the actors to come in and out, 
behind them, but also they hide all the junk on the stage. The stages are always full of junk, always. And the only way, the only way to deal with it is to hide them behind the sets of ears. You know, there's furniture, there's costumes, there's all kinds of stuff. So that's a complete set in Jefferson. Now, Lincolnville, that's a nasty water stain up there. The roof must have leaked. Um, this is a, I suspect this range is closed since I was last there. I don't know, but I suspect it's, um, it was very, very much on edge. I mean, there, it was hard to find anybody who had a key. You know, there was all this talk about how the roof leaked and this and that. But what a curtain. A beautiful curtain. Now, you know, it's got a nasty stain, but we could take care of that. It's just that there was no will to do anything. They, they were just, they given up, you know, psychologically. Mm -hmm. And I suspect now physically as well. North Edison Grange is gone. Uh, they sold, they closed it up, and they sold the building. Um, this is too bad because they had, they have still, the curtains stayed, the curtains got sold as well. And the guy is running a cannabis operation out of the building. Um, anyway, they had a remarkable set of curtains. This one was either Ceres or Hera or one of those goddesses, Pomona, uh, picking fruit. And it's part of the range ceremonies that you have these goddesses who go along and pick fruits and things. But there was one painter who specialized in either Hera or Ceres or Pomona you know, doing their fruit picking. And there are three of them in northern Maine, three of the curtains like this. This is a sweet building. I mean, it's got the ceiling, it's got paneling. That's their grand drape. Mm -hmm. Just gorgeous. And it had been kept rolled up so long that it's fresh, it's very fresh. Again, a, not Venice, but one of these Italian scenes. It's signed here. Um, L.L. Graham from, um, no, this is L.J. Pooch from Boston. But oh my god, look at the luscious, luscious drapery. And then the gold frame, so that the picture inside is actually in a picture frame. And here's their street scene. And this is, uh, oh no, I've got onto another range. But there were five, five beautiful curtains by L.J. Pooch. There was Pomona, there was, there were eight curtains there all together. And I don't think this guy, cares one bit about it. He's, uh, he's got this canvas operation. And so uh, I talked to him, tried to persuade him to, you know, not let them totally get ruined, but who knows? The Grange did not take any steps to get the curtains out before the building was sold. That was the big problem. Once the building is sold, everything in it goes with it. But before then, they could have taken the curtains out and restored them in somebody's barn. I don't care where they get stored, just somebody's barn would have been fine. This is more of a, a folk art backdrop. You see, it's quite simple. New Sharon Grange. Again, I'm afraid this one has bit the dust. Thorndike. This is very, very typical. And it's good old George. You've got the same George. All the old Grangers had George. Yep. And I love the way they put all their ribbons from the thing <laughs> up across here. And again, the token drapery, the, the token, the sort of all-purpose generic country scene in the middle, and then local ads around the outside. This company is from upstate New York. They send around salesmen to, do, to sell the ads. But what a sweet little stage. It's just um, picture perfect. Now, in Green, which is near um, Manchester? No, where is Green? Mm -hmm. It's not very far. I think it's near Winthrop and Manchester and so forth. This is also by O.L. Story. It looks totally different from the others. It's got blue drapes. This thing is only eight feet high, which is 
a whole foot and a half shorter than this, but it's 20 feet long. Mm -hmm. It's the longest, skinniest curtain I've ever seen. And they have these wonderful benches that they, that they sit on. But it's very strange proportion. I mean, you could touch the top of this curtain if you're standing on stage. You could, you could touch the, the top of the arch. They just, they just made it very short. And again, you can now see this is the same company from upstate New York with the, um, the ads and the bit of drapery on the outside. We've now actually cleaned this up. And so it's now in great shape. This was a little bit beat up before, and now it's perfect. Um, down near T, not Trenton. Uh, near Bath. They'll come to me. In Whitefield, the Arlington Grange um, is now actually a community center. It's not the Grange anymore. But I love this ad. <laughs> old Scotch Ginger Ale from Old Scotch Company. But he's got this wicked drunk look on his face. Some of the ads are very funny. There's one wonderful ad somewhere that says, eat and grow fat at so-and-so's cafe. Good food, <laughs> eat and grow fat, the wrinkle-free, no, and be wrinkle-free. <laughs> and there's another one for an ad on the curtain in Vermont where they're advertising a hairdresser, a hair salon, no electricity. Um, let's see. No electricity, everything done with hot irons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know? Now this one, I've just got a few that are not fringe because they're so beautiful. But here again, see that oval? That's the same guy as Chesterville and the one with the cows and North J. It's, he's got the same oval approach and a beautiful frame. This is, we left this unrestored because, quite frankly, the paint was gone. And we don't overpaint. We don't go in and restore to make it like new. What we do is we'll touch up and, and hide a, you know, a, a scrape or a boo-boo a of some sort. But in this case, we would have had to completely overpaint the screen all the way. So we left it rather than uh, make it pretend. It's a gorgeous curtain. They found it under, whoopsie, they found it under the stage. They found it underneath here. And we had to hang it outside the stage. There's the new roller, the new ropes, because they turned the stage into a children's library. They didn't know they had the curtain lying underneath, so they put in uh, they built in shelves and they built in chairs and, and all sorts of things. And so the children's library is actually on the stage. <laughs> so the curtain hangs in the front and then it's kept it rolled up most of the time. Booth Bay Town Hall. This is very strange. <laughs> I know. It reminds me of Mice's plates, you know, old Mice's plates. But, and it's actually painted on top of the old advertising curtain. But somebody had some orange paint. And they were tired of the old advertising curtain. You just see, see the green underneath. So they painted over and put new orange, uh, new orange ads on. It's it's just it's very funny. I love it. <laughs> and now uh, North Wayne again is a historical site, not a not a grange, but Ben Hur and Ben Hur's chariot race was a favorite motif after. Sheon Castle, we get Ben Hur, we got them in Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. And this one in North Wayne is just pretty hilarious. It's uh, a 1930s version of, of Ben Hur. And um, we put him up as a, he's now at the back of the little stage, because that is one heavy, almighty heavy roller. And they wanted to keep the roller, but it was too dangerous to ever roll that roller up. People could been killed if that roller fell down. So we put it at the back of the stage and left it down permanently as a backdrop. So it would not roll. 
And that's the one that is quite ridiculous. Um, it's the only opera house curtain in Maine that's left. But you see, the, the person who painted it had no idea about the size, about the proportion of the central picture. So it was a painter who saw the curtains, but got it all wrong. I mean, there's way too much curtain, and the picture is way too little. So, but there it is. It's just all wrong because the person was not a scenic artist. He was just an artist. And this one is now a Grange Hall, but now it's a, a private home. Somebody has bought the little Grange, and this wonderful little curtain with a scene of Venice. This is up in a tiny little crossroads town north of Augusta. And they made it into their, this is their living room now, and they have this very beautiful scene of Venice. <laughs> yeah, a couple guys. And they were, once word got out that they had a curtain and they had a stage, Keenan um, had three curtains and they closed. And so they brought all three curtains down and just gave them to them. And two of them were quite boring. But this one was fun. There's a street scene. So we put it up at the back of their stage. Here's their piano. Here are the two guys who own the building. So now they have a backdrop. And here's their grand drape that comes down. And they have a sweet little living room. It's got a stage in it and a piano. Yeah. Manchester Grange um, has a whole group of curtains with no grand drape. When there's no grand drape, you don't know who painted anything because only the grand drapes were signed. So there's no signature, there's no stamp, there's no hint. It's a very good street scene, but we don't know who painted it because there's no grand drape. This is all velvet, you know, replacement, drawstring stuff. This one. More again, more like folk art than scenic art. But um, they had this sort of round top stage. There's a tiny bit of drapery peeking out, a couple of vases of flowers, and then basically a sign painter who painted the curtain for them. <laughs> Another one, but look, we didn't sell all the ads. <laughs> <laughs> so they went ahead and put it up, but Probably he was hoping to sell the ads, and they never got sold. So that's what it looks like when you don't sell all the ads. Oh. Now, Cherryfield, just up over there, they've got a, a very odd set of curtains. They don't know where they came from. They seem to, they, had, they belong to the school, but they don't know if the school bought them as a set from somewhere else or if they were made for the school, they don't know. And this has nothing to do with cherry peel, but this is the grand drape. This beautiful, beautifully painted romantic castle or cathedral back there, and a romantic bridge, and the whole thing. But nothing to do with cherry peel. And here's one of their country scenes. But again, that's, that's not a local mountain. They have a couple of these very well painted country scenes. I think they have a total of six curtains up there. Here's their street scene. Now this one, look at, look at the quality of this and this, and then you look at this, and you know that it's not the same painter. This is probably a cherry field art teacher who, who painted a street scene because they wanted a street scene. It just doesn't have the detail doesn't have the grace of the others. Now, you all know where Trenton Grange is, right there, yeah. possibly. It's used primarily for auctions these days, and that is a very nasty tear that is almost separated the curtain in two. Not quite, but almost. It was a beautiful curtain. It's been very badly beaten up by misuse. So I finally got a hold of the Grange Master there as a woman and sat her down and said, please, please, roll the curtain up. Don't let us, the, the auctioneers, you know, they were just leaning stuff up against it. They, they didn't care and they didn't know. 
So now it is rolled up and tied off. And at least it won't completely fall apart. There might be an auction there next week. You know, the stage is full of stuff and they've got, you know, it's full of clutter and full of uh, stuff they're auctioning. But at least the curtain is out of the way now. So someday, someday, somebody could come along and say that it's really quite a beautiful curtain, but under stress. Columbia, further down from Cherryfield. This is in storage. They don't seem to have the stage anymore. Maybe the building burned, I don't know. But it's, in, it's just on the floor. Uh, they've got it rolled up. And it's by a man from North, Northern New York. And his great, great, his great grandchildren told me about this curtain. And I came over and saw it. It's a picture of Dunluce Castle in Ireland. It's very handsome, but it's missing quite a bit of its top drapery. It got torn off when it was um, taken down. So there it is. It's sitting wrapped in Tyvek, and maybe someday they'll, they'll work on it. But so far, anyway, it's safe. And this I just wanted to show you. This is the only banner we've ever found, a uh, little Grange banner from Hancock, New Hampshire. But it's about eight feet square. It's got a roller. It's got top boards. It's got, and it's a it's a traveling. I think it's a banner they took to fairs, mm -hmm. to the county fairs. It's quite sweet. We cleaned it up. Oh, <laughs> now that's oh my, I know Swan's Island. They, they brought me out there, and it was one of these hot, humid days. And I could see what happened. They had no air conditioning. They had no, no control at all. And the air was just so thick and heavy. And basically, the whole curtain was rotted away. You can bear, you can see the bar, the bridge. You can see that once it was very beautiful. But when we went to roll it up, our hands just went right through the material. It was just punk. It was just not even there. So I think they found that. It was so, so mildewy that you didn't really want to have it around anyway. But that's what can happen. Oh, and this is, I'm just going to show you. I did read a couple of my books if anybody's interested. I only wrote one book, by the way. Oh, never again. Only one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I decided a couple of years, two, three years ago, that it was time that somebody wrote about these curtains because they've never been written about. In fact, we are the only people in the business of taking care of them like this. Uh, there are some companies, some conservation labs, that take care of some of the big, fancy opera house curtains. They treat them like paintings. They line them. But those curtains fly. They don't roll, so it's OK. But the kind of you know, community hall curtains, we're the only people in the country doing this. So I decided it was time to write a book about the artists, about the materials, about the styles. So I did it about Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. And, um, and at that time, as of now, just before COVID, so three years ago, I also listed every single curtain in every single town that I knew of at that point. Not all of them got their picture in there, because you took uh, like five times the size of the book. But I, I wanted to make a list so that 50 years from now, somebody could look at this and say, oh, there should be a curtain in the morning. Where is it? You know, or there should be a curtain in, in whatever town, in Vermont, New Hampshire, or Maine. And let's, you know, let's see what it is. And maybe it'll still be there. But we had to start from scratch. We, we had to start from nothing, just rumors or people calling me and saying, my cousin says that there's a curtain that she grew up with, but she can't remember which building it's in, but that kind of thing. So I thought it was time to just collect what we knew before it was too late. And, uh, and, and even so, some of the ones in the book have now just not disappeared, but they've closed. And so they are, I hope, still out there, but not necessarily. And. Uh, so I think that's it. I think that's all. I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
often do with these talks is I didn't go through the process of conservation. I usually show a slide of how we make a patch, for instance, because we make our own iron-on patches. If you use the iron-on patches in Walgreens and then try to take it off, you would rip the fabric underneath. So conservators don't ever use things that can't be reversed. So we make our own with a film that we melt onto muslin, and then we iron it onto the back side of the curtain. And with more heat, you can peel it off. It's a mess, but you can do it. Whereas with something like a Walgreens patch, you, that will never, ever come off. It binds too, the, the glue is too strong. So we do that, and we try, and we try to um, pad the rollers. This roller here is the original roller, so we've added the tail on this line. So it now wraps around three or four times before it gets to the curtain. And that helps with the wrinkles. Just helps give it a little bit of softness as it rolls up. And um, Would so, you mention the gelatin for this surface? Yeah, the, it, there were several places where, be, the, because of it being acrylic paint, it had crackled badly right through down to the um, base layer of pink. And so MJ couldn't just in-paint that because there was too much depth, too much difference. So she, um, so we got uh, Carol to go buy some gelatin, some plain old Knox gelatin, painted the gelatin into these cracks. And then when it dried, it helped um, raise the level inside the crack so that the paint could then go on top. We've never done that before. That's pretty Never really? done that yeah. before? Because I don't, other than it's all straight code and maybe one or two others, we, we'd have never, this is very rare to have this paint. Most of the time, 99% of the time, it's, it's water-based paint. Well, this, this particular scene was done somewhere from the mid-50s to the late 50s, because Mary um, McFarlane remembers when the Grange hired this Ellsworth artist, whose name is Whitman, W-I-T-H-A-M, to come and do this. And the Grange paid her a couple of, maybe two or three hundred dollars. She said she would never, ever again do that, such a job, because and each week the Grange would meet and they'd say, no, we want you to change this. <laughs> right. But at any rate, unfortunately, Marion didn't come tonight, and I had hoped that she would and be able to think more about what was there before. Oh, I think, came. I, no, I, think, oh, I think what she did was overpaint. She didn't. Oh, yes, she no picture. And, and she said she put more paint on. She's, I, she, the only thing she could say about the difference was that this ended up being more realistic than what was there before. Whatever that means. So <laughs> whatever that meant, I yeah. can only conjecture. Mm -hmm. but, but, but definitely, I mean, MJ took one look at it and said, oh, overpainted. So it had another layer of paint put on in, in the 50s that only contributed to the crafting, unfortunately, because um, it's... It, it was all paint that was not not the right paint, put that way. It wasn't that it's bad paint, it's just that water-based paints would have um, soaked into the fabric and would have stayed instead of flaking and cracking off the top uh, 50 years later, or now 70 years later. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, you know, that's just the way it was, and that's fine. A few of them are acrylic. Uh, and a few got what we call house paint. You know, somebody took some green paint and just added a field or something. But most of the time, it's, it's these water-based paint, much, much more absorbent. But considering it was 70 years. Oh yeah, considering it, not bad at all. No, no. So any questions? Yeah. You fixed a tear in the sky, yeah. right? So did you have to paint in more? Or no. When the, when the tear gets fixed, does it come completely nicely together? Almost perfectly, but also it's completely out of sun. The tear is within this much that you don't see. 
over there, so it's all mended with an ice patch. But then the front of it, MJ said, ah, I'm going to leave it because it's evidence of the tear. It's out of sight, out of mind. You can't see it at all. Okay, so it's off the stage. Yeah, it's off stage. It's in that section that's okay. too big for the stage. And uh, some of the tape had come in, and, she, and where it come in, yes, yeah, she, she touched up the paint. But very, very light, it's called in painting rather than over painting. And she used acrylic paints again? She, what paint? Acrylic paint? No, yes, we use acrylics. And again, conservators, they, they want, they, they use a paint that is not the same as the original paint so that Someone can come along later with infrared and see what has been overdone. To my mind, I don't care about doing that. But, the, but we actually found a, a whole set of paints from, uh, they're called flash paints, they're from little pots. And uh, they match the matte. They are not too shiny, they're not too flat. And there's so many little colors that we can mix and match and make make the, the right colors. So you did a lot of research about paints and all this material. Well, we did. We did at the beginning. We did quite a lot of research. We asked uh, other conservators. We asked um, uh, scenic artists. Well, only one or two. But I asked because there were very few of them left. And, uh, yeah, so we asked around. And actually, we copied. There's a laboratory in Massachusetts called Williamstown Conservation Lab. We asked them what they used on, on a curtain they had done. And we liked the results so much, we just copied it. We said, we're done. We don't need to do any more research. Why are we going to fuss with this anymore? Mm -hmm. Any rate, uh, thank you all for coming. And take care of your uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll formally end now, but if you have any other questions, uh, ask her. Sure. Um, and if anybody knows of any curtains that they think I don't know about. <laughs> are there any other parts of the country other than there are, there are, uh, there were thousands, and there are many, many fewer now, because the rest of the country didn't keep things the way New England understood. And, you know, if there's a small building that's only half used, they tend to tear it down. Also, you have um, much, anything in the south, you've got the awful building problem. And out the west, you've got all these tornadoes and things like that that blow through and those blow down the little buildings. Do uh, all granges have these? Almost all granges have these. Because they needed something for their ceremony. They needed to be able to reveal their their panoramas or their what do you call their their things they set up. So they needed to have something that goes up so they can reveal what's on stage. I, I used to live in Pennsylvania and there was a grave across the street from my yeah. house. I don't remember having any part of this. No, I have identified that kind of one that was being left. So you speak on it. Um, and then they sold the ground and the gates yeah. and got all the yeah. 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 We found some in Colorado, we found some in Texas, in advanced high schools. I did a whole, I spent three years looking national. And I have to admit that what I found was not worth the money I spent. Oh. Okay. All right, well, thank you for my Yeah. 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 Oh, but our website it shows all the ones that it's tall. Oh. 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 Oh.